Welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Today we are joined by Carl Broadbent. Carl is a great guest. He is, uh, he's got a wonderful backstory. So he started building websites about four years ago, uh, you know, went home one day after getting laid off from a job and said, I've got to figure out how to, uh, how to streamline my income and not have this happen again. He did the usual search for how to make money online and started his first website that very same day. Fast forward to today, and Carl is full-time. He left his job a year ago, and he builds websites full-time as an affiliate marketer. He has a really cool backstory he shares about how he got started, uh, his first site that he built, which he no longer has any longer, but how he won a contest from the income school team and got to spend a couple of days learning from, uh, from that crew and how it completely changed his trajectory. He's full-time now. He has a portfolio of around nine websites that he manages. Uh, he also has a YouTube channel where he shares his monthly P&Ls and other tips and tricks for affiliate marketers. So we talk about the nature of his portfolio, uh, where he's putting his emphasis, uh, his thoughts on large sites versus small sites. We talk about how he hired writers and scaled out his team to where he now has uh, seven or eight writers, a couple of editors, a VA to help himself out. Uh, we talk about keyword research. He does a lot of keyword research for himself and other website owners and just dive in a little bit about his process there. I ask him some questions about when to sell sites versus how, when to keep them because he's sold a number of websites. So we get into that discussion. We talk about info sites versus affiliate sites, where he's putting his time and his attention towards. He's got some, some pretty strong opinions about that. We also just touch briefly on a huge content push he's making on a brand new site he started on an age domain. Uh, age domains are a big topic of interest, so we get to hear a little bit about some of the strategies he's using when it comes to this content push. We close out by talking about an affiliate marketing conference that he's putting together, and that is, uh, that is going to be live in 2022 and uh, who he has there and kind of the nature or at least the, uh, the reasons behind why he put together a conference and why he's putting so much time, effort, and money into making that happen. All in all, great interview. Uh, great to talk with someone who's uh, gone from uh, just starting his first site four years ago to now making a full-time income. We get to hear from someone who is doing it day in and day out. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman, and today we are joined by Carl Broadbent. Carl, welcome. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Yeah, I'm, we're thrilled to have you, to be honest, and uh, uh, excited for today. I, I, it's really great to do an interview with someone who's, um, you know, just a fellow affiliate uh, marketer, website builder who's kind of in the trenches, as you are. We'll get into a lot of the different case studies and whatnot that you have on your on your YouTube channel, but it's going to be great to hear from you. I know you're doing this, you know, all day, every day. So yeah, pretty <laughs> <Thank> much. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for joining. Why don't you give us some background? I know you have a really fun background to go through about how you got involved in um, in this side of work and, and where you're at today. Yeah, sure. So my name is Carl Broben. I'm an affiliate marketer and online publisher here in the UK and been doing this now for around four years, but uh, full time for about a year. Mm, so okay. it was um, it was a transition from working a full time corporate job, and I started to work part time to build this business up. And then a few nice things happened to me along the way that actually pushed me into doing this full time. And here I am now, four years later. Like I said, my, just about to um, complete my first full year as an online publisher. So yeah, I mean, really good. Congratulations. That's uh, that's big to go from, you know, four years ago, just having kind of a gleam in your eye, an idea in your head. Yeah. And here you are full time and celebrating a full year of full time as it how I mean, where where did you first start uh, when it came to website building? What was the first thing that caught your attention about it? So I was in between jobs. So I was a training to be an area manager for a large company. And then I suddenly got called into a room one day with about 20 other managers and they said, thank you very much for the last seven years of work, but you're no longer needed. And was kind of came home and I was like, okay, I've got two weeks to do something. So I started looking for jobs and I got an interview pretty quick with a large uh, supermarket chain, went for the interview. I was lucky enough to get a really decent level job straight away. So I was very fortunate for that. 
but I came home and I just thought, okay, I'm going from kind of one rat race to another rat race, if so to speak. You know, there's nothing wrong with the jobs I had by any means, but I'd kind of been doing that for a long time. And I just thought there must be something different out there. Maybe I can have a total career change, a total, you know, 360 flip on things and, and look for something new. So I just typed in um, making money online or working from home, something like that. And I came across a video from a, a fellow YouTuber, Alex over at WP Eagle. And the video was about four hours long and it was how to build a website. So I just kind of sat there literally at my kitchen table and just thought, okay, what do I build a website on? I couldn't think of anything. I didn't have a single clue. And I decided to do something that was a, a, a hobby of mine. Oh, well, it's been a, a passion for years and it was Monty Python. I loved everything about Monty Python, the films, the people. And I just thought, I watched one video that said, do what you're passionate about. So I thought, right, I really like these. I've watched all the films. So I looked at the competition and there was one huge Monty Python site. And I thought, right, okay, I'll build a site. And I literally sat there and watched Alex's video from minute one to four hours. Well, pausing in between. It probably took me about eight hours. Yep. <laughs> but my wife came home from work and I said, have a look at this website. And she looked and she was like, oh, that looks pretty good. What, what is it? And I said, it's mine. And she was like, what do you mean it's yours? I said, I've built it. She was like, how? I said, I've just sat here and built a website in four hours. And you know, it literally took off from there, really. That was the first instance of getting into it. Then obviously... I dived into YouTube and I watched every video going for about a year later. And then another big incident came my way. I was at work and uh, a few people knew what I was doing. And I got somebody came running into the cafeteria and says, uh, you've won. I was like, what have I won? And they was like, you've won income school. And I was like, what are you on about income school? And they're like, you've entered a competition apparently and you've won. And I was like, just running around the, the canteen going, what have I won? I thought I'd won a car or a house or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out it was a competition. Um, I just basically commented on a video and they came ho over to the UK and stayed with me here in my house for a couple of days. And they give me two days of one on one on one tuition. And it literally that's when it springboarded me then. That's when I knew it was kind of real uh, and it just wasn't this fake online passive income that you hear about. It was real and, and it just snowballed from there, really. Wow. So you had the income school folks come over and, you know, I think I remember catching, I think I remember seeing part of that video or something and uh, I had not made the connection until just now. And so, so they came yeah. over and, and just, was it the Monty Python site they helped you work on? No. So by then kind of a year later, so I did the Monty Python one, ran with that for a few months and then realized, okay, there wasn't as much um, scope for expanding the site. So I thought I'll do something else. Uh, when I was younger, I used to I used to manage and run a, a tropical fish shop, a pet store, and I used to run the tropical fish department. So I thought, well, I know more about that than anything. And every video says you write about what you know. Mm -hmm. And I knew that. So I set up a fish keeping website, uh, which is still going to this day. Uh, I sold the website. It did really successful. They helped me grow it. Yeah. So they came over and they worked on that. I actually had two websites. One was in the health health niche. Uh, kind of skincare and one was in the fish section and they said drop the healthcare one it's going to be so hard it's going to be so competitive let's just focus on that one so that's what we did and it turned out to be very successful and I, I exited the site uh, and I got a good amount of money for it and I'm really happy so yeah so that that was about so from starting the Monty Python one about a year to a year and a half later that's kind of when it all happened. So I think this is interesting because I imagine that a lot of people watching would just love that opportunity, right? To have um, a couple of experts fly out and just sit with you and roll their sleeves up. And you said that it was a big turning point. What would you say were the biggest things that you were maybe doing wrong that they came in and helped with? Uh, and again, I'm trying to think of people who might be in those shoes and going, man, what could someone like that come in and say that would turn the corner so much? What were some of the things they said that turned that were the turning points for you? I think what they showed me is that there is a process behind it. I think I was kind of, you know, throwing things at the wall and hoping something would stick. Mm. And I think they came in, kind of organized me. So there was like, here's a spreadsheet for doing keyword research. This is how we're going to um, cluster them into topics. And it was really organizing me and giving me something to focus on. So a clear path. Whereas I think I was just, I, I think I could have wrote, 100 articles and maybe 50 of them might have worked because the other 50 was so random that it just wasn't being searched or it was too competitive. So 
I think they came in and showed me that, you know, there is a process to it. And if you do this very basic process, you have a really good chance of success. And, and that kind of ticked it off for me as being a business rather than just something you do online and hopefully it grows. It was like, no, there is a process. You can make it work. And, and this is how it works. So, and they give me some expectations and some realistic numbers. And it gave me, you know, my wife obviously at that time didn't know a clue about, she still thought it was a pipe dream. But, you know, she they gave us some realistic numbers, showed us some real life examples, showed us some of their portfolio. And it was like, OK, light bulb moment. Oh, this could actually work. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was amazing having it was Ricky and Jim that both came to my house. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's great. Um, I want to go back to one of the things you said right in the beginning, and it kind of dovetails with what you just talked about. The um, So the idea that you basically searched how to make money online or some variant of that and took action right away. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear because you ended up ditching that side a couple months in, you know, probably, like you said, it just it wasn't a big niche that you could kind of go into and expand on, but you took action right away. And so people, you know, especially people who are just starting out, there's this question that exists, which is, do I wait until I learn more? until I do more niche research, until I understand the process better yeah. because it'll make the niche more attractive that I go into, or am I delaying too long? Do I need to just dive in and just roll up my sleeves and start working? And then I'll learn faster that way. It sounds like you had a lot of success with diving straight in. And then along the way, once you learned enough, kind of ditching that site and moving to something more, you know, better, I guess you could say. I mean, what are your opinions when it comes to that? Yeah, I, th I think... Absolutely. I, I think you need to actually, it sounds silly, but I think you actually do need to build a site that fails. And that might seem crazy, but I think you have to actually do that to understand why you've failed, because otherwise you'll see some success straight off and you'll think that that is the key to everything. And you can get kind of above your status with it and you sh start shooting for higher keywords than you should be doing. And you don't really learn. So I think that first website really taught me how I needed to do things. And I, let's let's go right. I just didn't get it right in the second website or the third or the fourth, um, you know, and I'm probably still not getting it right now 100%. But certainly I know more than I did then. And do you know the first website, the Monty Python one? I wish I'd have kept that. And crazy as it seems, this is nearly over four years now, just four years gone. I still get commissions from it. So oh. it is, even though I even though I abandoned it, I have tried looking it up in the archives, seeing if I can uh, rejuvenate it. Um, and I can't find it, but it, I still get the odd commission from it. So there are articles and links still out there. And it's, yeah, it's crazy. Every now and again, I get this odd commission that pops up and it just reminds me of, wow, that was four years ago. That's crazy. That's funny. Mm. Yeah. I think, uh, we were interviewing someone a while back and, and they were talking about a, a site that they had on, on, I think Halo was the game that they had and they couldn't find it anymore, but they sure wish they could go back and find it because it would have been fun to kind of almost use it as a, as a comparison to how, when they started versus now how they do things and how, how, how night and day the process has, has become. Yeah. Particularly with me now being on YouTube and actually telling people what I do, you know, my YouTube channel is all about kind of what I do. It's not me saying, this is how you build a website. This is a step-by-step -step tutorial. It's basically just following the life of somebody who does this for a living. And I, I show everything, whether it works or not. And I would love to have that as a base model to say, mm -hmm. you know, you think your website's bad. Do you want to see <laughs> mine from, from four years ago? I'd love to do that. You know, so that would uh, be even good. just some screenshots, but yeah, I've got a way back machine. I can't even find any screenshots of it, unfortunately. But, oh man, not even on archive. Uh, got uh, not even on the way back machine. Huh? I've tried everywhere. I think it was only because it was only up for a few months. I didn't don't think it got captured, but um, I clearly see it in my head. And some of the articles I thought were actually pretty good when I think back. You know, I was on point with some of them. You know, but there is literally one website that is the official Monty Python website, and it runs everything. So I'd have never have competed, but you know, yeah. uh, it would have been a good to show as a case example. So it's obviously now you're you're full time at this, but what about the the, the steps leading up to being full time? When did it become your goal per se to exit your standard nine to five job and make yeah. this a full-time go. And then what did you do? What steps did you take to take your portfolio from where it was at that moment to get it to a point where you could go full-time? I think this, I think the process was led a little bit by obviously real world needing a certain amount of income to come in before I could even contemplate doing that. 
it was okay having an income where one month I might hit $2,000 and, you know, that might have been enough to pay the bills. But obviously my wife's very cautious and she was like, no way, you know, you're not giving this up until, you know, you have a solid income for a set amount of months. So I kind of set myself a target of hitting, honestly, I think it was around $3,000 a month every month for six months. And that wasn't really from one website. It was really from, you know, one, two, three, it didn't really matter. I just needed to make sure that every month that amount of money came in. And I, I, I told my boss at work, he was secretly a fan of doing this, although he didn't like to say, because he didn't want to lose me. You know, I'd say I was, a, I, was a, I was a trader for a large supermarket. I had a quite a senior position. He didn't want to lose me in that position. But he was always, every time he walked past me in the car, he was like, how's your sites doing? <laughs> and he'd always ask me, uh, and then he'd say he wasn't interested, but then he'd ask me an hour later, have they done any more? Uh, you know, so, um, and yeah, he knew as well. I said, he, he was very specific as well. He was like, you have a good career here. Your income could be X amount in the next year. Are you sure you're going to hit that? And he, even he agreed with Mike and said, I'm not letting you quit until you hit this figure. And it, it, it took off. It took off. And I can't say it was one website that did it. I think it was a, a number of, one website and a couple of smaller ones. And then I started to do a little bit on YouTube and it, well, not so much YouTube, but online affiliate marketing. And then it grew from there. So yeah, only when I knew I had at least one and a half to two times my salary coming in every month, did I then think, okay, I can risk this. Uh, and it was, even then I dragged it out even further. You know, I, I think I could have quit after possibly, two and a half to three years, I think I could have quit, but I left it even longer just to make sure. Just to make absolutely certain. Oh, any, yeah. reg any regrets a year later? Do you miss any part of it? No, now I don't regret what I'm doing. I absolutely love what I'm doing. There are elements to work in a full-time job, which I do miss. And I actually just produced a video today and it was, and it's about kind of nine things that I got wrong in 2021. And one thing that always surprises people when I mention it is, I think kind of working from home for me, wasn't a great match. I do think I enjoy that getting up on a morning, getting showered, having breakfast and going out to work. Mm. And then that feeling of walking through the door and you've done a good day's work and you just leave it behind. When you're working from home, if you've not got an office or anything, you just constantly are at it. And no matter how much I've tried to train myself, all right, I'm only going to work eight till four. That's all I'm going to work. It never happens. It never, ever happens. So, you know, I, I do miss elements of going out to work. I miss the camaraderie with my colleagues. Um, I miss that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. I do still pop in there every now and again to see them. And when I go there, I, I come out always thinking, cool, I won't want to do that job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But half of me goes, but I do miss, you know, the jokes and the, the, the chat and the banter and stuff. So, yeah, I do miss that side of it. Yeah. And that, you know, it's, um, you're a good example of how, you know, you've used your YouTube channel to connect with other people and to create a sense of community and, um, you know, things like this podcast and these things are good, are good outlets, but at the end of the day, they're still not as interactive as going to a nine to five job. If this is something you're doing full time. Yeah. And it's important because, you know, I, I think everyone struggles with it in different ways, but certainly for full timers, there's obviously you've got to be careful of burnout and not getting so far down a down a, down a hole that, you know, you, you miss, you don't have any uh, connection, I guess you could say, like you talked about. So. Yeah. 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 One of my, um, one of my uh, most popular videos is called blogger burnout. And it's ah. literally because I have actually gone through it probably in the last four years, I've probably gone through it. I think seriously, a couple of times where I've literally for about a week, just thought, I, I just don't know what to do anymore, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that old imposter syndrome. So especially, particularly if you're on YouTube, you start to fall in trap of that where you think, oh, wait a minute, his videos are so much better than mine. And then you it puts you off making them. And then you, you you start working on your websites more. And then there might be a Google Core update and your website goes down. So you think to yourself, oh, I can't even do that. And then it's just a vicious circle. But it's like a lot of things. Then it just takes one thing to happen. You go, oh, I'm right back in this. I'm, I'm, I'm pumped to do it again. And yeah, it's, it's like that. But I think I've faced blogger burnout kind of a couple of times, really, in four years. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What, what do you do to get around it? I mean, do you, do you push through it? Do you take some time away? Do you have any, any recommendations? Cause it, like you said, it's a real thing, you know, it's, it's just, it's so easy. And it's also maybe not even burnout, but distraction as well is, is kind of in a, a side camp, but next door to that, like, how do you, how do you get over that and stay focused? If, if I'm really kind of at this burnout stage, then I just have to have time out. I just literally have to shut everything off for a week. 
go play golf, go for walks with the children, do whatever I need to do to take my mind off of it. And that is what it is. You do need to take your mind off it. The good thing about this business is that if you have structured it correctly, you can do that. You can take time out and it doesn't affect you whatsoever. I've recently had, we've had a recent issue in our family recently, and I've had to take about three weeks off. And, you know, it might sound a little bit big headed to say this, but my income never changed. I, you know, I know there's a whole passive income and everybody thinks it's kind of a swear word, but it pretty much, it is to a degree. Now I, I couldn't leave my business for three months and not do anything. It would decline. I would see some drop in my income, but I can leave it for three weeks. And, you know, that's what I've done this, this past week. And I've probably had one of my best months ever. So, you know, this business is really good for that. So if you feel that it's getting really too much, take proper time out. If you feel like you're just getting a little bit deflated or a little bit tired, then I just kind of ease up a bit. So I, I've learned to try and prioritize, uh, particularly in the last few months, what is important to me. So, you know, producing YouTube videos is great but I can go overboard. I had a month, a few months ago, where I did 17 videos in a month. Oh my. And I was, I was totally burnt out. Uh, it took every minute of every day to do them. And I saw very little increase, you know, in the traffic and the earnings for doing that. Whereas if I do one a week, I seem to get very, very similar numbers and it's very manageable. Let's talk about your YouTube channel. 17 in a month is crazy, man. We we uh we, we have to push hard around here just to get, you know, to get our one out a week as well and that's, you know, that that's that's a good pace, but 17 is is crazy. Let's see. So you I was catching up on your YouTube channel before uh before today's interview and I was fascinated just first off by how transparent you are. So basically on your YouTube channel you're you're kind of documenting every month what you're doing on your sites, kind of the highlights. You're going through the income, the revenue, the expenses. Um, very transparently, I noticed, you know, last month uh, you talked about how you had a really high month of expenses and you kind of went through why that is. And so I thought it was really good. What What is your goal on your YouTube channel and how does that relate to what you're doing with your websites? So with my channel, it was initially just a way of documenting my progress, really, just to look back. You know, probably probably thinking of Spencer's videos on, you know, watching all the, uh, the series he did, you know, how mm -hmm. he, you can document and track your progress. So I think that's why I started doing them. Uh, and then it turned into a little bit more helpful. People were asking, so how do you do this? And I didn't really want to go into tutorials or anything like that. I'm not the best, you know, at video editing and things like that. So I just thought, well, all I can do is show you what I'm doing each day. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing this full time. I sit here at 8 a.m. in the morning and I start work. And if you want to see what I do, I'll kind of bring you along. And then I thought to myself, well, I might, I might as well just be 100% transparent and show you everything. So I even show my P&L and people think this is crazy. It's like I even show my affiliate incomes. I show everything. So it's literally my P&L that gets submitted to the accountant. That's what people get to see. So I literally show everything. And I know that's going to come with some negatives and it's going to come with some positives. Uh, and I think it really helps people to see if they want to get to full time and do what I'm doing, they can see kind of where they need to be and the kind of income streams they'll need to get to, you know, take over maybe their full time job. Mm. But like I said, the negatives of it is you can get some obviously some comments from people. You can get feedback that might not be great and that could hit you. And then you kind of think to yourself, why am I doing this? Wait a minute. Why am I sharing all this information for you to say these comments? So it does has, have its pros and cons. The aim for the channel, I really don't know. I, I do love to grow it and I do help, love helping people. Again, in this video I made today, I said how I spent probably more time in the last six months helping other people than I have helped myself, which needs to be a bit more of a balance. I, I have a full team of writers, I have a full team of VAs, and I have kind of neglected them a little bit. And I need to make sure that my side of the business, because it does need to provide me with an income each month, is is running smooth before I kind of help others. If that sounds right, if that sounds okay. Don't want it to sound too, you know, selfish or negative. But yeah, you know, it is what I do for a living. Well, it's the old analogy from the uh, flying on the airlines, right? They say put on your own mask before you you, yeah. know, you lean over and help everybody else. So yeah, um, and and you talked about your portfolio on on uh, well, you talk about every month in your P and Ls, and I'm curious to dive in a bit on the portfolio that you have. You talked about how you have this this YouTube channel, but it's really dovetailing with your portfolio of websites that earn your full-time income. I think you said you have nine, nine websites right now in your portfolio. 
Is that is that right? Roughly yeah, that nine, nine websites. I think three of them are kind of on the bigger side. I mean, we're not talking huge scales. Again, one of the reasons is I spend too much time doing other things to actually grow my own portfolio. But I've changed that mindset in the last couple of months, and I'm really going heavy on a couple of websites. So one of my latest um, case studies is using an age domain. And I've never used an age domain on the website before. It's always been a brand new domain. And I've used this age domain. I've started the website off with a full team on it. I put my entire team on it to see what we're capable of, see how quickly we can grow a site, how much content can we produce, what will it cost at that rate. And in the first month we launched the site, we had 200 articles on in month one. Wow. Uh, and now we're up to uh, over 450 and we've not hit month two yet. So, you know, it's on target for having like a thousand articles in six months, which is crazy. Um, but again, I wanted to see if the team and process I've built can do that and what would it cost to get to that point and share it with everybody and let them know. So, you know, some people like websites with a small amount of really beautiful, unique content. Some people like the bulk content, just, you know, get as much content on there as you can. So I've kind of gone from in the middle. It's good content, but there's a lot of it. That's a that is a major push out of the gate, um, and, and you're you're kind of reading my mail. My my question for you was why nine sites? Do you do you focus on maybe having a broader portfolio? We had um we had Shauna Newman on the podcast a couple of months back, and she spoke about wanting. I think she said she had about seventeen in her portfolio at that time, and spoke about to her the benefits of that. Uh, I know a lot of people who like to focus on one or two sites and just pour everything they have into it. So I'm curious, what made you ultimately decide to put so much effort on these three bigger sites and and really this this one age domain site that you're working on so i I think the benefit of having let's say nine or ten sites is that you kind of get to see what's working and what what isn't really so rather than putting all your hopes in one site because i have i have a some sites that are failing i have one that i call my mega website project and this was going to be the biggest site i've ever built i was going to put a lot of content on there we are talking thousands of articles and I got to 350 articles and it's not doing anything. We were a year in and it's still not moving. Now, if I had to put all my eggs in one basket and that was my only project, I'd have been sunk. You know, I'd have, I'd have lost $20,000. It's going nowhere. I can't get rid of it. I would have been really in trouble. But having then other websites that while I was doing that were taking off, I can then go, okay, wait a minute, let's pause that now. Let's Google figure that site out and let's flip our attention to what is working. So I've got at the moment, like say three sites, one of them that I didn't think I would really push this month because it's out of season. It's a seasonal website. And uh, even though it's out of season, he's doing tremendous. The, the traffic's going up, the ad revenue's going up. So I've literally just shifted half my team and said, you go on that site quick. It is working. Let's dump a load of content on there quickly. And I'm able to do that. So having that spread of portfolios just eases the thought process that, I mean, I would dread having everything tied down to one website. You know, it only, you know, one algorithm update, you know, no matter how good your site is, it can be a train wreck and you are in, you know, back to square one. So I just think it's safer to have a, a, a smaller portfolio of websites uh, and really just see what's working. And I can test more things as well across different niches. Yeah, boy, I think we're in the middle of, a, of an algorithm update now, or it might be just wrapping up. I mean, they, there's yeah. many of them a, 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 a year. And yeah, like you said, it, it doesn't seem to matter to some degree what type of site you have or how you've built it. The, you know, most sites are getting hit at some point by that. So yeah, that's a that's a good point to make. Um, let's let's talk about the way that you're that you're building sites. Are you focusing um, across your portfolio mainly on affiliate? Uh, are you, you, you I've heard you touch on ad revenue? I mean, what's what are your um what are your primary monetization channels when it comes to to your websites? Yeah, pretty much informational content for display ads at the moment. Um, probably about an 80 to 85% informational and the rest on products. Uh, if I do product guides now, I am trying to do real product guides, that I call them, where you actually buy the product or I borrow it or I rent it and try and do real product reviews with videos. It's very difficult now. We're here in the UK, we're coming into winter, so I can't really do anything that's outside. So uh, the, most of the product reviews are put on hold and that's fine because I can just focus on informational content. Uh, ad revenue is just such an attractive thing. It's you wake up every day and it's there. It's, it's not if somebody clicks it and buys it, it's just a constant stream of income. And I love that. And there are times of the year where it's good and times of the year where it's bad, 
But when you hit those times of year where it's good, like we're in quarter four now, it is it is fantastic to wake up and see their ad revenues double in and sometimes even triple in overnight. And you've done nothing else other than just sites being there. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, the uh, the Q4 ad revenue bump is just a thing of beauty, is it not? <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> like you said, it makes you just want to start all info sites after that. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I say it every year. I can't wait for Q4 next year. And I've just said it again in my video today. I'm like, I can't wait for Q4 next year. Because every year we say it, it's going to get better. And if you look at the advertising trend on, on revenue, it is just exponentially growing each year. And it just doesn't seem to be giving in. So uh, an informational context, it's easier to write, it's easier to rank, it's, it's, it's so much easier to build sites like that. So yeah, my focus is pretty much on that. I do have a few affiliate Amazon products and affiliate links in there. And one or two of my sites are obviously more affiliate based, but not much. I'm trying to really focus on the information. When it comes to the the ad networks that you use, do you have a preferred one? Have you tested different ones? Um, do you have uh, uh, any reasons why you might choose one or the other? So I, primarily with Ezoic and Mediavine. Um, the reason I'm not with AdThrive Thrive is I usually sell my sites before they get to the point where they could be accepted to AdThrive. Um, so yeah, Ezoic I use a lot basically because you can get them pretty much on a website from day one. Uh, and there are a lot, lot of functionalities on Ezoic that you can play around with and test. And I, everybody knows my channel. I love to test things. And that's a great platform for being able to do that and report back to people. And Mediavine is just so solid. You just literally, you know, when your site hits a certain potential in traffic, you just hand the site over, put the ads on and you forget about it. It is, it is such a rock and that's fantastic. But I can use Ezoic as a platform to show others how to uh, optimize their websites for ads. So yeah, I like that. So you talked about selling sites. You mentioned it at the beginning that you've sold a couple of sites. You just mentioned it again, that you tend to sell sites before they get to, you know, X traffic number, ad thrive traffic number, we'll call it. <laughs> but what's your strategy with selling sites? Um, how do you determine when to sell a site? Why do you want to sell it? My strategy is basically the website has to be on an upward trend. I, I, I've always said that I'd hate to sell a website that was in a decline. I don't know how anybody, I see them advertise all over the place. And I think, how is anybody going to buy that? The traffic is like that. So it would have to be on an upward trend. It doesn't have to be huge and it could even be on a plateau. Um, but I tend to sell them when they're a, a figure that I think is quite affordable for a lot of people. I, I watched your podcast with Shauna Newman and she said, same thing. And I wanted to repeat what she said, because she said, I love the cash. I like the lump sum of cash. And it is so much easier to sell a website for 30, 40, $50,000 within a matter of a week or so than it is to try and sell a website that's a hundred or 200 or 300,000. I have friends that try to sell currently websites ranging anywhere from uh, 200,000 to a million. And it's so long and such a, an arduous process to sell them at that figure that uh, I just think flipping them at forty, fifty thousand dollars is so much easier, and it's a quick cash revenue. So uh, that's that's why I like to do it at that kind of level. I think it's just affordable to a lot more people. I'm guessing that's where you might also get some of the cash to fund a project like the one you're doing right now with your age domain. That sounds like the perfect use of some uh, proceeds from a from a site sale. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the fish keeping site. And I had another one, which I called my high ticket item sale, which is a website where it was all based around products that were a thousand dollars or more. Mm. Uh, and that was doing really well. And I sold both those sites and we'd be talking anywhere from, I won't give the figure away for someone, but anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000. Uh, and like you say, that is a nice lump sum to start another project off. And that's where I do get my funds to, you know, grow and try other new projects. So sometimes people see the, the, the projects and think, how can I put three or 400 articles a month on the website? And you're not going to be able to, not for the first year, not the, maybe the second year, but, you know, you have to have a, a successful site that you either flip or brings in such a substantial income that you can reinvest that. And that is the key. It's just that reinvesting, that believing in the process and just snowball effect that gets you further and further up the level of, of, of income and level of site, really. You talked about your team, um, and obviously to, 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 to publish that many articles in a month, you'd have to have a team. When did you start transitioning into having a team of writers? Did you initially write all the content yourself? I mean, it sounds like you wrote the Monty Python content yourself. 
back on your very first website, but when did you start transitioning to having other people write for your site and, and whatnot? And, uh, and now you must have a, a decently sized team to be able to produce that kind of content. Yeah, so my team currently is um, eight, I've got, I think I've got eight or nine writers. I always forget, about eight or nine writers. I have uh, two VAs and one, sorry, two editors, one VA. So about eight writers and they produce the bulk of my content. I do still have to outsource some of them. They don't, they're not able to do that much content themselves. So I do outsource a little bit, but I'm trying to keep it in-house as much as possible. Uh, and then my editors go in, they format the articles, add internal, external links, images, videos. Uh, and then uh, my VA will just proofread it, check it off, make sure it's fine. And then, um, and then hit publish. Uh, and that happened, I'd say, after the fish keeping site. So in my entire journey, at about probably two years, I think when I started getting a process from income school and a spreadsheet, I started looking and thinking, how am I going to write that one and that one and that one and that one? This spreadsheet just got bigger and bigger. I just thought I'm never going to be able to do it. And then it was just a case of because I was working full time, I was able to invest every penny that the website made back into content. So if it made $500, I ordered $500 worth of content. And at that time, it was all outsourcing. I didn't have a writer. Uh, and then I think when the website got to around $1,000, I thought, okay, I'll just go on to Upwork or somewhere like that, and I'll just advertise for one writer. And I got one writer who was <laughs> bizarrely, um, she was on Upwork, and she started writing me for uh, about six months. And then she just said, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah. She says, you know, do you live in York in the UK? And I was like, yeah. And she, started, she was like, do you live in this village? And she said the name of the village. I said, yeah. She says, I live just down the street from you. Oh, my gosh. Come on. <laughs> and I was like, what is the chances of that? Yeah. And she actually lives just in the village. And she wrote for me for about six months, did some incredible work. And then she she took poorly and she stopped writing, unfortunately. But she was a fantastic writer. And it was just incredible just that she was just down the road. And she was on Upwork. <laughs> I was gonna, Upwork, you could be working with anyone from anywhere. That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't advertise, you know, it had to be a UK writer or anything like that. It just, I think she saw either, I think I might have just started doing YouTube and I think she spotted something in the background and, and recognized the street. And I think that's how she put two and two together. She was like, you're the guy that I'm writing for. And then, yeah. That's, that's a wild story. <laughs> that's a wild story. Where do you go now to scale out your team? Are they, um, do you go to a certain spot to, to get writers? Uh, do you have a, a process in place for that? I don't have a process. Usually people come to me due to YouTube. Now it's pretty easy. People reach out to me and say, you know, um, like I said, I took two weeks off, two or three weeks off recently. And it's everybody's jumped up in the comments and said, we'll help you out. Do you need any help with content? Do you need any more editors? Do you want me to edit you some of your videos for you? So kind and gracious for people to do that. And, and that's basically where it comes from. Usually I don't never ask for anything for free. I'll always say, listen, if you're willing to do it, have a go. And I'll just be honest, if you fit the profile of the team and my style of writing, then I've always got work. You know, I've, I, you know, I can only expand my team so much. I have to make sure everybody gets a certain income each month. So I do feel a little bit committed to make sure they, they need to feed their families. So I do need to make sure they get a certain amount of work each month. But what I always do is I give them a spreadsheet each at the beginning of every month. I do the keyword research. They all get a spreadsheet each. And is usually 25 articles in each spreadsheet. And if all eight or nine writers can do that entire spreadsheet in the month, great. I don't put any more pressure on them. I just said, there's a spreadsheet. Do as much as you can. And usually they get it completed. If they don't, it just rolls over. And then the next spreadsheet, they will just say, okay, I didn't manage to do five articles, Carl. So the next spreadsheet only send me 20 on and we'll add them five to that. So they've continuously got a spreadsheet to work through. That's great. That's great. I did notice when you were talking through one of your YouTube videos about your, your P&L, um, you had talked about keyword research and the depths you go to for that and how you even do it as a service. What um, Can you enlighten us a little bit on some of the processes you go through with, uh, with your keyword research without, you know, giving everything away, but, you know, yeah. tell us a little bit more about, I mean, I, I know for me, um, first, just hearing you talk about producing, I think you said 450 articles in a couple of months, my first thought is, oh my goodness, that's a lot of writers. My second thought is, wow, that's a lot of keyword research, right? So I'm, I'm curious to hear about your process for keyword research, given the volume of, of keywords you're obviously able to find. I think I think once you start a, if, you're, if you narrow something down, so if you've got a spreadsheet for 25 articles uh, and that writer uh, is going to stick to that topic, 
Once you actually find kind of one keyword in that topic, let's say off the top of my head, you're talking about garden ponds or backyard ponds, fish ponds. Once you get down that rabbit hole of focusing on that one, it's quite easy to fill the 25 up for that. It's not like I'm doing 400 articles on garden ponds or anything like that. So if you break it down, so what I'll do is I'll say, okay, you're going to write on garden ponds and water features. This lady might be working on garden lawns and lawn care. So when I break it down into 25, it's much, much easier. And to do kind of eight or nine um, spreadsheets of keywords, I could pretty much get one a day done. So I'll do the, the first or last month, uh, sorry, the first or last week in every month down to keyword research. And it only usually takes me about a week to produce enough content and keywords for them to do for the entire month. So the process is just manual. Uh, you've mentioned the service. I do have a service um, that I use, uh, that I offer to people. And that's basically grown, um, just crazily grown um, to the point where I literally turn the service off, off on the website. So it's called keywordcare.com. I literally turn it off more than it's on um, because it is just me doing this. And it, in the beginning, it was a way to fund the growth of my website. So I thought every time I sell a spreadsheet of keywords, it's enough money for an article or two. Uh, and that's how I did it. And then that became limited. So I'd say, okay, I'll do one a day. So I could do 30 a month. Uh, and then people are asking for more and more. And a lot of people have had really successful websites from my service. It is not rocket science. And I don't make out to, you know, I it's just a manual search. I will go to each topic. I will do Google alphabet search. I will use some tools. And I would just start literally clicking links and deep diving into uh, that topic or that keyword and finding low competition. So two or three websites on page one that got a really low authority or poorly written content, or it's not matching the search intent. And I just look for all the factors. And when I hit that little golden nugget, okay, that ticks that box, then that's the, the topic or the title. And then I just come up with a creative topic or title for them that has the keyword in there. And then I add that to the spreadsheet. And it is simple as that. It's just manual search. It just is so time consuming. That's why I tend to switch the service off quite a bit. I mean, that's why it works so well. I was going to say, so basically, we're, you're going to have us all just kind of hitting refresh every couple of days here, trying to see when the serv <laughs> service opens back up again. That, that That's as crazy as it seems. I mean, if there's anybody out there that knows how to grow a service like that, get in touch with me. I, 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 I tend to switch this service off and on at the beginning of the month. So in November, I switched it on. I think it was the 1st of November and I sold out in 30 minutes, which was embarrassing. So the, literally the website went live for 30 minutes and then sold out, appeared and everything. Uh, yeah, and like I say, I'm able to do about, at the moment, I could probably pump out 30 to 40 orders a month. Uh, and I think I could probably get 200 orders if I left it switched on. So, um, But people are buying it. Yeah, the well, thing is, people are buying it because they want my input. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am trying to streamline it. I am trying to get uh, a team that will help me at least answer emails and actually send the orders off once they're done and tidy the spreadsheets up and things. So I am trying to build a little bit more of a process. And it's 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 I don't try and focus on it too much because it's not where I want it to be. I didn't right. want to go from a job where I have to answer to a boss to a service where I have to answer a customer. But I feel so obliged that I know I can help people. So that's why I do it. But I just I just have to limit it. And you know, my apologies for anybody who does try and order it. I, you know the reason why. I just try and limit it. So I basically, you know, I give you a good service and I don't, you know, um, destroy my own life and my own business. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair, obviously you're doing a great job if there's that much demand for it. Um, hey, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you had mentioned in a YouTube video that you have a conference that you are prom, uh, putting together. I, I, do I have that right? You are organizing uh, uh, basically an entire conference for, for website uh, owners and builders? Yeah. So the affiliategathering.com. Yeah. That's, it, that has grown to be uh, quite a big event, actually. So that all came about, I was talking to another uh, fellow affiliate marketer and blogger. And as we were talking, we just chatted for hours. And his wife says... Whenever you two get together, you just nonstop talk work. It's all shop, 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 shop. And she said, does this happen with everybody else? I said, yeah, it does. She said, well, maybe there's a market for that. And I was like, what do you mean? She's, and she said, well, I run and organize conferences. That's what I do. I'm an, an events manager. Uh, and she runs some really big conferences here in the UK. And she's like, I wonder if there's anything like that in the UK. And I said, well, 
there is SEO conferences and there is kind of black hat conferences. I said, I wouldn't want to run anything like that, you know, um, but I do think there's a market for getting like-minded people together because you know yourself, it's such, it can be a lonely place. There's, you know, not many people get what we do. My, my children and my wife kind of get it now, but I, I you know, if I say, oh, this keyword's ranked, oh, it was in position three and it's now position two, they're just like, great. You know, but, you know, yeah. for me, that's a, a, a buzz, you know. So I thought about how we can pull everybody together and we decided to have a gathering, and a gathering of affiliates. And that's all it was going to be, just a small gathering of people to talk shop. And it kind of grew. Um, people got interested. People started to want to um speak at the event i mean we've got a, a fantastic headline speakers now uh, i mean we've got ricky from income school we've got john dykstra and um, we've got alex from wp Eagle, sean mars leon angus amina Gardner. we've got a ton ben adler there's loads of people coming to speak and we've sold hundreds of tickets so it's now quite a big event and it's here in york next year so it's friday the 20th of may 2022 and it's a lovely venue. It's in like a, a five-star location. It's a beautiful event. All the facilities you need are there. It's great for public transport and the links. And yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's grown to be a bit of a beast, which is which has caught me by surprise. Congratulations. I was going to say, now you're in the conference business. <laughs> you're in the, the, uh, the events <laughs> business. Yeah, that's great. Um, how many days How many days is the is gathering? It's just a one-day event. Um, the is some smaller fringe events that some of the speakers are going to be holding. So people like Income School, it's a great chance for them to come over to the UK and meet some of their membership, uh, people who have joined their course. So they're going to do some a fringe event on the evening before. Uh, I think Morton uh, from Passive Income Geek, I think he's going to do a fringe event. So there are some smaller events, and then there will be the main conference on the Friday, a full day event. And it's also going to be live streamed. So for anybody who can't attend here in the UK, we understand restrictions with COVID and we've got lots of precautions in place with that, but we are going to do a live stream. So you can buy a live stream ticket, which you get to watch the entire event. And not only the event, you'll get to watch things like backstage um, workshops. You'll get to talk to people, ask them questions. You'll get to interact with them as well. So you know, if you can't make it, an online ticket is certainly a viable option. And I think it's going to be something quite unique. I really do. Well, that's great. Yeah, some of the some of the speakers you rattled off, I know, have been guests here on the on the podcast, and so that'll be exciting to hear them hear them uh, live and in person. Or if you can't make it live and in person, you can tune in online. We'll um we'll make sure that we drop a uh, a note here in the uh, in the in the show notes with the with the right. link. That's uh, let's see, do I have that right? Affiliategathering.com. dot com. Yeah, that's yep. it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, I've got a, just a couple wrapping up questions as we wrap up here for you. I, I'm just curious to hear from you. Um, what's next? And, uh, you know, you kind of touched on a bit about how, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're almost reshaping your focus. You're, you're focusing, you said in the last couple of months, you've had this new focus on growing sites bigger and larger. I think I have that right, but talk about what's next, what your goals are and how you're adapting your focuses as you've, you know, learned what you've learned uh, based on what you've learned in their, in your first year full time. Yeah, certainly focusing on more the website portfolio. Um, I do believe if you're going to be on YouTube and you're going to show some examples, you need to have some success. And it's not that I've not, not had some success, but the success I've had, I've usually sold. <laughs> so, mm. you know, sometimes it does look like, oh, wait a minute, he's only got a small portfolio. He's not making 100000 a month like some affiliates. So I do think I need to work on that as a basis. I have a core portfolio websites that brings me in not only an income that I can then relax and try other things on YouTube, um, but also gives some good examples of, you know, uh, success stories or failures, but it would be nice to have a, a, a portfolio that is growing to be able to show some examples. Then it's, you know, people know I'm as transparent as I can be, but, you know, you do still get people who question you, you know, is that site really doing that? So I would love to have a, a really successful portfolio to to show off really and say this is possible and this is exactly how long it took me to do that so yeah so the focus is on that youtube wise i i want to produce more quality content so i again i don't want to do tutorials but i do want to not rush out 17 videos a month just because i'm trying to please youtube and um, you know i do want to try and give my audience what they want 
I do want to try and broaden the YouTube channel a little bit. You tend to get trapped a little bit in a niche and either YouTube doesn't like that or your audience doesn't like that. But I'm going to try and see if I can broaden that a little bit. But yeah, less content on YouTube, but more quality content. Do we have any more? Do we have any um, maybe four hour tutorial uh, videos in your future? Like uh, <laughs> like the one you watched from Alex? That is definitely not going to happen. I don't know how. It takes me all my time to do a 10 minute video. I don't know how on earth you do a, a four hour video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the same, alone on that. I mean, same as managing a team. I, I'm friends with a lady who has a portfolio of 40 odd websites and she has 60 writers. And it's like, how do you manage 60 writers? I just don't understand the, the, the how you do that. Um, but that's why the affiliate gathering, that's why I'm looking forward to it. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to get it going because I want to meet these people. I want to talk to them and say, how do you manage a team of 60 writers? Or I want to say to Alex, how do you edit a four-hour video? What's the process that goes into making something like that? So that's a great opportunity. And one of the reasons, maybe a selfish reason, why I wanted to actually do the event. Yeah, because I want to I want to pick the brains of these people and find that out. I spoke at an event very recently. Um, one of the first times I've gotten back to speaking since um, since COVID and the pandemic. It was great to be at a live event, first off. The yeah. energy was palpable and it wasn't even, you know, my industry. I was just a speaker there. But what really struck me is exactly what you mentioned, which is how, um, and it, the conference, it was, it was talked a lot about, about how uh, this specific market had had an explosion of business during COVID because of the nature of what they did and, and whatnot. And there was this feeling around the room that they couldn't really talk about it with their friends and their colleagues because... They didn't know if their friend or colleague had lost their job or were in a totally different spot. And so getting them together for a couple of days was just such a dynamic environment. You could feel it. Um, and it speaks, again, to the power of having other people that understand what you do, going all the way back full circle to what we started talking about with burnout, with motivation, with staying focused, with learning from others. So, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's it's a good opportunity to learn, but also a good opportunity to stay inspired and motivated. Yeah, I mean, especially when you talk to somebody who knows what you're going through, you can say figures and numbers without kind of scaring them or looking like you're being big headed or anything. If I go back to my job and say, you know, how much did you earn last month? And I tell them they just they just think you're either boasting or you're exaggerating. But when you talk to somebody who's got similar businesses or stuff, and they go, yeah, yeah, that's understandable. That's achievable. And, you know, when I listen to figures like John Dykstra doing, you know, 120,000 a month from ads. You know, if I told somebody that you can earn $120,000 from ads, they'd go, you're crazy. But when you can actually talk to like-minded people, they go, yeah, yeah, that's that's doable. And that's some, and they understand kind of where you want to be or what you have to do to get there. So I think that's why it's so important to be surrounded by kind of like-minded people, whether they're just starting or whether they're above your kind of level. I think it's it's important to talk to all levels of people. I still get a big thrill from talking to people who just press publish on their first article you know I that that thrills me it's like you know what was it like how long did it take you how many words did you write how do you find the topic I love that you know and like-minded you know when somebody says I've just published 100 articles this month great how did you do that so yeah I get a thrill from listening to both sides and and that's exactly like say why we wanted to get the everybody together in this industry so it's not going to be too deep. It's not going to be too technical. There will be something for everyone because I understand there's people hitting publish on the first article and there's people making hundreds of thousands a month. So I want to cater for everybody, really. Final question for you. It's a broad one. What, what is your single biggest piece of advice for someone who is wanting to go full time? in this business for someone who wants to eventually leave their nine to five job and build websites for a living? What's, what, what is the biggest piece of advice you would have for them? So if it's for making a living full-time, diversify. Just make sure you don't have, I don't know if this is a British term, but all your eggs in one basket. I don't know well, we've said over here too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Just, just that is it. Just don't do that. Oh, you know, the thought of saying to somebody, quit your job tomorrow, and they do. I know a case study and a YouTuber who did exactly that. And the next day there was an algorithm update and he lost literally 75% of his traffic the next day. He's fought back and built it up. You know, I would never say anybody quit your job and then that happens. So you make sure you've either got a buffer level of income. So if something does happen, you've got either enough cash there to see you through uh, maybe six months, nine months, so you can build it back up. 
or you have enough uh, of a portfolio to cover one or two sites getting hit. So yeah, definitely diversify. I know a lot of people say that, but it is true. If it's full time, that's what you want to do. Make sure you, you cover that. Make sure you've got that buffer gap financially and asset wise. That's great advice. That's good. That's good. Well, congratulations on your success on going from it being nothing more, I guess, than an idea four years ago to um, leaving your full t- leaving your full time job last year to now having a portfolio of sites and uh, starting a conference uh, and, and and you know cheers to all that you have on your plate. I I think you have a lot going on, so we're, we'll have to check back and hear how you're managing all that. But but no, congratulations, it, and it's a great um, it's a great case study for all of us watching, especially those who aspire to. Um, uh, start from scratch and build something that they can then turn into a full-time uh, full-time income. So yeah. um, thanks for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate having you. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. It's been actually something I've wanted to do for a long time. So yeah, you've uh, ticked a box on my bucket list. Thank you. Oh, well, good to hear. I don't think I get, I don't get to hear that very often. So I'm going <laughs> to take that with me as we go. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. And um, until next time, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much. See you later.